Okay. Well, thank you all for joining this session. This is the um, second session for the day today, color management from input file to RIP controls. So we're going to have a conversation about what's taking place upstream and then through the RIP. So we've got our session time now slated and we're going to get started. Um, one thing I wanted to remind you all about is if you could please um, self-mute your phones that way there isn't any background noise. Um, and as as um, people join and are still joining, if they don't self-mute, I'll take a moment and do that just so that we can um, not have any background noise. So, all right, so thank you again for participating and here we go, we're gonna get started. So one of the first things I wanna mention or discuss with you guys is the front end desktop area. So the very beginning stage of where we all start, Photoshop, Illustrator, possibly um, we are working in InDesign. So any of these types of uh, programs, we're going to have some type of color management taking place. So in one second, I want to mute Janet. Okay, gotcha. I think maybe, there you go. Oh, maybe not. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you got yourself. So. When we take a look at these different controls and different settings, we've got Illustrator, we've got Photoshop. Um, the main Adobe Creative Suite is going to be at a preset default setting. So if I show you what that is, I've got Photoshop open, and I'm going to go to Edit Color Settings. So in Edit Color Settings, we can see the Photoshop or the Adobe default is this setting here, this preset in the upper left corner pull down. North America General Purpose 2. What this preset gives us is the working spaces as sRGB, as US web coded swap. Those are our defaults. And if you look, depending on the um, Adobe edition version you have, um, it depends on kind of what this window is going to look like or how it's going to be structured. But if you'll notice, um, kind of down here in the lower right corner, this section says synchronized. Your Creative Cloud applications are synchronized using the same color settings for consistent color management. That's a big one right there. That's a big deal. So for me, I want to make sure that Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, whatever my settings are that I choose or that our company decides on using um, in our shop, I want to make sure that I am synchronized across all my platforms and I also want to make sure that the other computers, other coworkers that are in desktop are also in that same condition. So um, the a little area down here, it says description. To synchronize color settings among your Creative Cloud applications, select settings in Bridge. So you can launch your Adobe Bridge program, preset what you want these to be as far as all these different conditions in here. You can preset this or use the preset pull-down window. But either way, you can preset this information and then set that information up in your Adobe Bridge. And then all of your applications, when you open up your Photoshop, InDesign, Illustrator, you can select the same preset and become synchronized. That's going to kind of help you in desktop to stay on the standard, whatever you want that to be, that's going to keep you on as the standard in um, your applications and for everyone in your department of the desktop area. So consequently, when I'm checking this information out on site, I'll tell everybody open up Photoshop, you know, go into edit color settings. What do you have for RGB? Well, I got sRGB, I got sRGB, I got sRGB, and then someone says, I've got big RGB. And then I'm like, okay, so where do you guys want to be? Um, and usually that person will say, you know, well, I don't know why I had big RGB in there, but I always wondered why my outputs didn't match everybody else's or my stuff looked different than uh, where everybody else looked like. So there could be some consequences for what we use here in these settings. So if we take a look at these presets for RGB, uh, North America General Purpose 2, our RGB setting default in this program is sRGB. And if you click in the pull-down window, of course, you see other options there. For the CMYK, it's a US web coded swap. 
And again, if you click, you get other options, other standards that are out there in the industry. Now, the settings for North America General Purpose 2, if I change that preset to North America Pre-Press 2, my setting for RGB changes to Adobe 1998. And you'll notice it does say unsynchronized because I'm not matching the default. So that's one indicator right there. Whatever it is you decide to select in these, pro in these applications for input or working spaces, I really want you guys to make sure that you're synchronized um, and you can set that up again in Bridge. That way, when you see the word synchronized, you know your preset is matching the standard of the shop, whatever you want that to be, across the board and everybody's matching. So we've got some different pre-press uh, pre settings in here as well. If we decide to make a change here and choose a different option, the word custom will appear in this setting. Now, over on the right-hand side, this is where we can save out a file for this. It's automatically going to browse to the Adobe directory path, and we can see that it's going to be a color settings file, .css. It says untitled, but this is where I would put in my company name here, you know, print shop or whatever. I'm just going to make something up. You can see I had great graphics before. So if I save that out, I now could give, a, give an explanation here and say, you know, um, this is, oh, I can't type today, our print shop setting, whatever. Whoever you want to say, explanation, right? Now you have that. You're not synchronized yet until you go to bridge and make that match. But just to say that's how easy it is once you make changes, you can save that out as that color setting file. All right, I'm going to go back to my default general purpose North America 2. So let's talk about what some of these presets mean. When we look at this sRGB and we hover with our cursor, at the very bottom in description, you get a definition here. Okay. So this is just being something simple. This is just showing me, reflects the characteristics of the average CRT display. Uh, by the way, CRT, cathode ray tube, uh, for any of you that uh, don't know, but that's a different type of a monitor than what we're kind of using today. This standard space is endorsed by many hardware and software manufacturers and is becoming a default color space for many scanners, low-end printers, and software applications. Ideal space for web work, but not recommended for pre-press work because of its limited color gamut. So all that information is down at the bottom of the display, okay, in the description. Now, that's just the setting for sRGB. If I change this to Adobe 1998, in the Adobe 1998, the description is saying provides a fairly large gamut or range of RGB colors and is well suited for documents that will be printed and converted into CMYK. Use this space if you need to do print production work with a broad range of colors. So just by looking at those presets and talking about what's going on in color, I've got a little file here I opened up and I kind of went on the internet and nabbed some different images. You know, you can find a lot of good stuff, reference material out there. But just to talk about those color spaces. sRGB, as the arrow indicates, is about that type of a size space. Then we have Adobe 1998, which is a little larger, and then we have Profoto, which is larger still. So out of our area of visible color, we can see, if we're working with an RGB file, if we save it as an sRGB, Adobe RGB 1998, or Profoto, we get small, medium, larger color, kind of grows in that color space. So this information is, you know, pretty important. If you want a larger input color range, you might want to go larger than sRGB. Now, we also see um, two, two, 2,200 matte paper, some kind of a, a designation of a media, and we see what our output or media is able to reproduce. So we can see out of everything we can have a visible spectrum for, we can see that there really is only so much gamut or range that we're really able to produce. All 
Hang on one second. Make it sure. Okay, Alexander Simpson, if you wouldn't mind viewing yourself. Okay. So the different color and file. Okay, let's see. Let me make this work. Okay, maybe you muted yourself now. Okay, great. Thank you. So we can see by these different shapes and spaces how our color conversions are going to take place. So when you look at this example, I mean, this is just a little preview, but just to say, well, gosh, you know, if, I, if my matte paper can only reproduce this much, and I'm working with Adobe 1998 RGB, well, you know, what's going to happen with those outside colors? Okay, so what happens is depending on our input space going to our output profile, if we look over to the right side, we're going to see conversion options, and we're going to see intent. This is our rendering intent. And so when we see this information and we go for a um, relative color metric, we're going to have a specific definition here. So with relative color metric, attempts to match the media relative LAB coordinates of the destination colors to the media relative LAB coordinates of the source. And then the source white point is mapped to the destination white point and most uh, recommended for most color conversions, especially where the source colors are already inside the destination gamut. That could be a big deal. Okay, so when we're thinking about working with that, we have some you know very good bits of information to be relating to. Now if I change this to perceptual, perceptual is going to get pleasing color preserving the relationships between colors. So all color is going to be brought inside and it's going to be mapped inside while colors are being brought inside. Colors that are already inside will shift to make accommodations for smooth transitions. So as our space gets compressed into our principal area, that information is going to all be mapped and floated differently, kind of sized down if you will. And again, this is going to give us pleasing color. We're going to represent everything, maybe not accurately. So even this says um, preserving the relationship of colors inside and outside the destination gamut is more important than exactly matching the colors inside the destination gamut. So we've got a couple of different intentions here for how we want to map our colors. So if I go back into that PDF, we look at the spaces again, we can kind of see that I might be working in sRGB, I might be working over here as a um, CMYK and other times uh, US Web Code Swap, and I can kind of see, well, here's my input, here's my output, what's going to happen with those colors that are there. So another example, taking my input gamut and my output and trying to set this up so that how am I going to re reproduce or represent color? The whole big thing here is perceptual. All of the color is going to be reduced to fit in my range. And again, pleasing color, all color gets adjusted, if you will. Um, our color metric choices, whether they're relative or absolute, is going to just capture the accurate data that it can. And then saturation intent is really going to push this color to the very edge of where we can print. It's going to stretch this information out to get as much as we could possibly accomplish for those settings. So when we think about these different options, really it comes down to a matter of preference um, for what you are doing, the type of printing you're doing. All right, one last area here is another example of um, taking our color. Relative color metric is going to take and accurately map what we can reproduce in, so the color LAB representation gets put from input to output to the proper LAB to proper LAB conversion. It matches it up perfectly. But then when we take a look at those colors that are on the fringe, out of range, out of gamut, they're just going to be brought in to that very edge color. Whereas perceptual brings everything in and adjusts and compensates spatially 
by moving all that color in. So when we take a look at these rendering intents and we take a look at our software options that we have, um, our, the preset in Adobe is relative color metric, right? They want to try to accurately represent color. That's great. You know, it's a wonderful thing that they have that set too. Now, with these different presets, um, I get the question asked, you know, okay, what should I set this to? What, where should I be? Really, it's a matter of saving out your files as different formats, printing them, and evaluating them in a properly lit environment like a light booth. And evaluate the outcome and see what you like best. See what is giving you the results that you are expecting. Every one of us kind of has a different need in printing or printing to different conditions. And really, it comes down to the selection of your personal eye, what you're thinking you like to see or use or what you're trying to represent. So in that case, you can do some testing. So I always recommend people just set things up and test. Now, what I've got configured behind me but in the background here, I've got three different files opened. So I've got my sRGB, I've got my Adobe 1998, and my Pro Photo. And if I just change through those screens, sRGB, Adobe 1998, Pro Photo, and I realize some of you might be seeing some delays in the screen changing, um, but just to say when that does catch up, you'll be able to see some color changes taking place there. A little um, area you can change too in Photoshop in the lower left corner, you can go ahead and set your your control, your condition that you see here to a document profile instead of the document size, whether it's flattened or has all the layers. And then you can see as I scroll through these different images, that little area changes. So I know I put in my title as well, but I can tell down here that's my Adobe 1998 embedded and this is my pro photo. So these three different embedded ICC input profiles, these embedded profiles for these files, sRGB, Adobe 1998, Pro Photo, has a different characterization, a different appearance on the screen. And then how in turn is that going to calculate or translate out when we go to the RIP settings? So how is all of this information coming in going to convert and be handled at the RIP? So when I go into my RIP software, the area we go to control these settings is in our quick set. So I'm going to go to configure printer, server will shut down yes, I'm not ripping or printing, and in my quick set I'll edit my default quick set. And this is my color management section right here. There's a bit of an outline around this area. Our default as a brand new install is all ICC profiles on. And if I click on the main button, Change Profiles, our default is matching Adobe's default in the input profile or working space. You'll notice I am sRGB and I am US Web Code Swap. If I hop back into Photoshop, Edit Color Settings, North America General Purpose 2 is the default, and it's sRGB US Web Code Swap. So what we do in our application is we purposely match Adobe's input working space, input profile. And as a caveat at the bottom here, use embedded profile when available. Okay, this checkbox is on. Use embedded profile when available. Whatever we have embedded in our file, again, sRGB. Adobe 1998, Pro Photo. Whatever we have embedded here is what will be preserved or taken into consideration when it goes into the RIP, will be represented, okay? We're going to hold that information and honor that. Now, naturally, if you felt like you wanted to change this to something different, you could deselect the checkbox, and you can leave this as don't use embedded, and then change these conditions here and make these be whatever you want them to be. And then you will be overriding the data here 
by telling it don't use what's embedded, but apply these conditions. Okay, so our default is to use the embedded and our default in the input profiles, this first tab profiles, is input profile, or you can consider it as the working space, which is what we got right here, edit, color settings, and Photoshop, that we default to what they're doing there. Okay. How about those rendering intents? Let's take a look at that tab. In this section now, you'll notice that we are defaulting to perceptual and we are not using embedded rendering intents. Hmm. So if I go to Photoshop, we're, our default is going to be relative color metric. And we're using perceptual. Hmm. So here's the reason. And again, this is my, my over the years best guesstimate uh, working with all these things out there in the field. So if a customer is a brand new install, and they're not aware of all these color management controls. Out of the box, we are going to match Adobe's default in our input profile tab. Because out of the box, that's where Adobe defaults to. So if a shop doesn't know anything about these settings and they're just working with the default, then that's fine. We're going to match what they're doing. We're going to embed what they're using as an embedded data. Now, the idea could be, well, what happens if the day comes along where somebody does not embed the profile upstream? In other words, it's considered untagged. If it's untagged, it's not embedded, therefore, these settings here would apply, whatever we have set. So we purposely match the Adobe standard in the case where a shop is not familiar with color management. They're using the Adobe default, sRGB US Web Coded Swap. But when it comes to our RIP, we're going to match that if in case they ever send a file over that's untagged, it would have used what they would have used in the design program. So it's just a matching, if you will. When it comes to the rendering intent, well, obviously, we are not matching. We're not using the embedded. So for best practices, our default software out of the box is perceptual, pleasing color. We want to be able to get good representation, all color rep reproduced. OK, transitions will be, um, com color, colors will be compressed, and transitions will be smooth, right? So the idea is perceptually, for a customer who doesn't know about color management, they're using Adobe, there's your default. They're using our RIP software, here's our default. We're going to give them a perceptual rendering intent to get good, pleasing color on the way out. Okay, anybody out there that has more information or education with color management, they might say, OK, well, here we are. We're starting out in our program. Let's change this to Adobe 1998. Let's change this to a Grackle standard. Um, we're definitely going to use relative color metric, life point compensation. And then what we'll tell, they'll, we'll tell people to do then, if you do change these settings to something different, OK, we su suggest that in the RIP software, you match what you would have done. So if you're using the um, Grackle standard, then we recommend that you match that Grackle standard. If you're using Adobe 1998, we recommend you match. Still saying use embedded profile when available, absolutely. But in the case of an untagged file, just by mistake getting through, it will use what we would have possibly associated to it here upstream. So the whole point I want to raise here is, see if I can kind of, I won't be able to get this side by side. The whole point I want to try to raise here is that whatever you're doing upstream in your desktop applications, if you are going to use all ICC profiles on, I strongly suggest you match your settings. So match that, you know, Grackle or the Adobe 1998, whatever it is you're doing, match that. Just in case something happens that's untagged, 
it would have chosen the same options you decide to use upstream in your desktop program. So that's our idea behind this, make that match. So again, out of the gate, out of the box, we do just match Adobe's default. When it comes to the rendering intent, again, yes, we definitely leave this alone as perceptual for pleasing color, um, and that's what we're trying to represent. And again, we have a whole slew of those rendering intent choices with and without black point compensation. And black point compensation is very interesting. If you ever get the time to test with this, um, save a file with it on, save a file with it off, and print and compare, it's pretty enlightening. So if I hover on this black point compensation, below you'll see the description. So black point compensation controls whether to adjust for differences in black points when converting colors between color spaces. When enabled, the full dynamic range of the source color, source space, is mapped into the full dynamic range of the destination space. When disabled, the dynamic range of the source space is simulated in the destination space, which may could result in blocky or, or gray shadows. Okay, so it's an, it's an interesting thing when you actually save a file with it on and off it's uh, pretty visually, um, you know, apparent. So it's a nice thing to kind of have to do a test uh, test of this and compare to see where you're at. So again, just depending on what you want these settings to be, we suggest you match whatever you're working with here. And again, the rendering intents by all means, you can change this to what you want this to be. Now, how about that third tab, output? Output default printer ICC. This is relating to over here on the right, in the background, my media ICC profile. This is the ICC profile or media profile that I'm printing to. Is it a canvas? Is it a photo paper? Is it a banner? So we don't change this here because we're telling it in the background, use this adhesive matte vinyl, that's the profile it's going to use. Okay, so even though I say that, you know, you're going to ignore this and leave this alone because it's using the information here, you will be compelled to click on it because there's an arrow or we're only human. So what this is showing you is a way to browse for a different ICC within this whole media profile. Now you're not going to do that. You would create a whole new media profile instead and change up the ICC as you wish and incorporate that into your workflow and use that as your main preset on the right. So, you know, this information is a little bit different. Okay, now let's take a look here at the schedule. Come Monday, when we talk about using specialty inks, specialty inks are um, our white ink, our silver ink, and our varnish or primers. We're going to come into this output tab and we're going to talk about this spot channel replacement. We're not talking about it now. We're going to talk about this on Monday. We talk about our specialty ink handling. We're going to talk about that then. Okay. So again, input profile, rendering intent. These two tabs are working with how my file is going to come in and what's going to happen to it. Use embedded profile and what should the settings be. So if we have all ICC profiles on, change profiles, the default that we work with is using the Adobe defaults out of the box, North America General Purpose 2. Okay. So let's take a look at some other bits of information here. Let me go back into this. When we send our file over to our RIP software, we are going to have a conversion take place. Our input file is going to get converted through this stable profile connection state. This profile connection state is converting input to LAB, and then from LAB, we go to our output profile. And the output profile is our media profile. So when we think about this input to output conversion, What's going to happen is our file on the front end is going to go through a conversion and then be represented on the way out. You could almost think of it how we're taking input to output right here. What are we doing with all these different settings in here in color management? Okay, 
Another way of looking at this, we've got our image or vector data. It has an embedded profile. It goes through our profile connection space. And then our output profile is applied, and we go to the printer, and the printer puts ink on media. Okay, so that's another example of how we can kind of look at this information. So when we do this conversion, this might be one of the things why you are creating an illustrator, a 50% um, cyan tint, and when it goes to the RIP software, it's not a 50% cyan tint anymore. Maybe it's 49.2 or 51.8 or whatever, but it's not the solid 50%. It's not that whole number right there. And that's because of this conversion that takes place. So what makes this conversion live is going to be the fact that we have all ICC profiles on. We're going to go through this conversion space. When that is on and we have the checkbox for the spot color replacement. The spot color replacement is going to look to our color matching tables. Because we have all ICC profiles on, input gets converted to output. If I disable that middle section, if I turn all ICC profiles off, this middle section gives a pass-through. My 50% cyan tint in Illustrator is a 50% cyan tint in my job editor, for example. I view it. So this is a big deal about this part of it, all ICC profiles on or off. Now, if I go into my software, our default is ICC profiles on. That's our default. And we do have the spot color replacement table on. So tomorrow, when we talk about swatch books, and our color libraries, we are going to get into more details about this spot color placement table. So for now, let's just talk about all ICC profiles on or off. All right, give me one second here. Gotcha. Okay. So we're going to take a look at these settings. All right, now I'm just going to go back out of here, and I'm going to bring a file in. So in Illustrator, I've got this file created. This is a spot color, and if I look at that spot color representation, uh, it's called Logo Red, and it's made up of solid magenta, solid yellow. Okay, very simple. So if I bring this file into my RIP software, and I open this up in Job Editor, I'm using my default quick set, which is all ICC profiles on. So we are going to go through the conversion process. So my job editor comes up. And uh, remind you guys, at the uh, bottom of the screen, below this little bar, you'll see CMY. Wherever I put my cursor is going to give me a dot percent value. So if I put my cursor inside this logo red star, you'll notice at the bottom, cyan is 3.9%, magenta is 91.4%, yellow is 90.2%. And that's because over on the left, I've got all ICC profiles on, and I'm engaging in that profile connection space. I'm converting input to output. I just showed you in Photoshop, I'm sorry, Illustrator, pardon me, I just showed you in Illustrator that that red is solid yellow, solid magenta. So you can see the conversion take place. Okay, now I'm not trying to say that this is a good thing or a bad thing. This is what it is. I'm just wanting to explain what it is. And we'll talk about maybe some of the scenarios of where you might want to control some settings. And we'll definitely be talking about that tomorrow. But just to say, I'll mention that in a moment. So if I go over here to the left where it says color management, all ICC profiles on, if I change that pull down to off, You'll notice at the bottom, I have to apply to get this to refresh. So it's going to reprocess my file without the color conversion, without the profile connection space. All ICC profiles off. Now when I put my cursor inside that red star and you look at the bottom, you'll see cyan 0, magenta 100, yellow 100. I am getting the recipe from Illustrator, straight out. Okay. 
So why does this matter? Why might I want this? Do I want it on or off? Okay. There's some different things to think about with profiling and your controls and your conversions. And I always suggest to do some testing. Rip and print some files one way or the other and get an idea and evaluate and see where your color is and see what you prefer. That's really what it comes down to, your preference. However, one of the things we're going to be talking about tomorrow is going to be swatch books and adding colors to our color matching table, to our library of colors. By having all ICC profiles on, by having this on and the conversion space takes place, along with my use spot color replacement table checkbox below is active. By having those things on and engaged in my RIP software, I could be controlling my library of colors and doing my color to make that logo red match through Swatchbook, a series of different changes in the red, finding the match color object, and then putting in that recipe in my software. Otherwise, I'd have to go back upstream to my design folks in Illustrator and say, Hey, can you keep printing me up, keep, keep designing me a bunch of different reds and we'll print them and see which ones match. And it really just depends on where you want the um, process to take place. Okay, where do you want this, who do you want to control this? Upstream and Illustrator, then they have to make sure they color it the same way every time. If we do it at the backstream in our RIP software, this is a spot color named Logo Red. I was showing you guys this the other day with the name colors. I got logo red as a spot color here. So I could, in my software, just add that color to my library and give it the recipe. And then all I got to do is tell my designers, okay, everybody, just color, just color it whatever you want. Name it logo red. And then that information is going to get swapped out in, in the RIP software. We're going to be doing that color conversion. And we have that in our color table. So when we use this checkbox on, the color table data is doing the conversion process. And we're going to be implementing and engaging and using our system-defined colors, which, is our, which are our Pantone libraries, user-defined colors, which are defined in LAB color space. And they are device independent. And then our print mode defined colors, which will be printer, media, mode, quick set specific. And that's where we kind of come along at the back end of Swatchbook. So when we think about our controls and where we want to handle this information, where are we going to get, where are we going to do the swap out of our color? And again, tomorrow we're going to get into Swatchbooks um, primarily, specifically, so we'll talk about that. However, we're thinking about where are those color replacements going to take place if we have our conversion set to on and uh, all and the checkbox is on for our stock color placement. We'll go through that conversion process and we're able to control the color libraries in our software. Otherwise, the task, the process is going to take place upstream in Illustrator and in Illustrator We'll have to have them reproduce a series of these red chain, reds, different reds, to find the one that we want to match, and then have them tell them, okay, design it like that every time. So, so as far as this color conversion takes place, input to output, this is something that um, you know we've got an option to leave it all ICC profiles on or all ICC profiles off. And again, depending on what you're working with, your color space you know, may make you decide if you want it on or off. So one more area I want to talk, talk about in the uh, color management section here is we do have some presets. In this pull-down window, we could change from all ITC pro profiles on to the recommended G7 profiles. And when I make that choice and I click on the main change profiles button, I can see at the Grackle 2013 and it's the Adobe 1998 setting, okay? Use embedded profile when available. So we're, we're complying to that standard as the G7 um, options here. 
if for whatever reason we go into on and we do make changes and we customize this to something that we want, I'm just going to make one change here, and then I say OK, I see the word custom because it is a um, modified setting from all ICC profiles on. So at this point, I can go to the arrow to the right here of Change Profiles, and I can say Save As, and I can call this whatever I want as my company name. So, you know, I'm a print shop uh, two or something, whatever. So I can name it my company name, and now I have that as a preset here. So that information, if I change this to on and I change this back to print shop 2, I get that preset. And when I click on the main button, I'm seeing my changes here. So you can always save that out. And I'd recommend that if you are going to make changes here, and that's fine, you know, do some testing, see what you like, make changes to suit your needs, then definitely do go in here and do a save as and give that a new name. And you can see you could edit or delete as well. So that way you have your own, uh, oops, sorry, you have your own custom name in the pull down to get back to. So this is going to have a definite impact on how my data coming into the RIP is going to be converted. And again, use embedded profiles when available, or if I said no, just out and out convert to these settings. Then whatever my input space is, it's going to get converted to this as I come into the RIP software. Okay. Back into Photoshop here for a moment. When we look at these different settings and we think about the different preferences we have here, edit color settings, North America General Purpose 2. So when is this really being applied? When is my working space going to apply as an, as an sRGB or as a CMYK? When is it going to apply as a U.S. web coded swap? Well, where are these apply to is really going to be when we say file new. So when we say file new, this is where we're going to see if I'm working with an RGB mode, it's going to be sRGB. That's my color space as my default back in edit color settings. If I change this to a CMYK, it's going to go to that working space, US Web Code Swap. So it's when we say new that that's going to be applied. Okay. Edit color settings again. We have these choices, profile mismatches, is missing, or if I'm copying and pasting between two different images. If I turn these options on and then I click OK, and now I'll close my pro photo and I'll reopen it again. Okay, so let's go to my C drive, drive 19, samples, training images, pro photo. Because I had those checkboxes on, it's going to tell me that the embedded profile for the file I'm opening does not match my preset. What do you want to do? Okay, again, this is truly your choice. It's a matter of deciding on what you want to do with your color management. So use the embedded profile instead of the working space, or convert this file to my sRGB, or discard it altogether, don't do any color management whatsoever. So this information, these choices, it's really a matter of what you think is the best option for you. And again, through testing, you can determine this. In some cases, you can say, I'm going to convert everything to my sRGB because I know that's a space that is appropriate for my output profile. And when I print, I can um, match a lot of the colors. Or I can say, no, let's use what they have in here and let's see how much of that color I can reproduce. What can I really re represent? So really, there's pros and cons to both of these. It's really a matter of your choice. All right. Now, what if I'm opening up a file that is not, does not have an embedded profile associated to it? 
think this one might be perfect. Missing profile. This one does not have a profile embedded. It's considered untagged. Leave it as is, don't color match it, or you can say, hey, assign it to my working space, what I'm using in my data, or assign it to, and then you can pick something completely different. So again, these options are for you to decide what you want to do with this. Okay. If I don't have those check boxes on, edit, color settings, if I turn these back off, and then I'm going to open up that city on a cliff again, it doesn't ask me the question. It brings it in, but notice in the lower left corner, this space, this profile is untagged because it does not have any identifiable embedded profile. So they consider this as untagged. This particular city on a cliff, when I bring this into my RIP, because I have all ICC profiles on by default, and in my input profile, I'm saying use embedded when available, but it's not available, it's untagged, it's going to use the default settings here, which match my Adobe, my, um, Adobe Creative Cloud software, so North America General uh, version. It's going to match that as a preset. Or if I changed it in my program of Photoshop, then I should match that in my program of my RIP queue. So if I do change this information from this standard to something different, I really should match that here so that when it is not available, when it's not embedded, like in this case, City on a Clip is untagged, it would apply these same characterizations that I would have done upstream. Okay, so that's the idea behind this as far as input to output and conversion process. Okay, so when it comes to talking about the swatch books, the print mode defined colors, when it comes to talking about um, the device link information, we're going to be getting into other sessions on that. Tomorrow we're going to talk about our swatch books and our print mode defined colors for vector spot color data, which is very much every bit of this file right here. And we'll talk about that. We do have the name colors in here as a logo and so forth. Uh, we'll be talking about that tomorrow's class. And then on Monday's class, we're going to talk about printing with specialty inks. And then on what do we have here? April 1st, 2nd, and 3rd is another series. Okay, good question. Wondering if we prefer sRGB or Adobe 1998 and why. So one of the things, um, oops, not that. One of the things that I'd have to say if I close these two out, if I just go comparing sRGB to Adobe 1998, and I've done some printing and, and comparing of these and seeing and using them in class examples. Um, the Adobe 1998 is a larger color space uh, than the sRGB. So the Adobe 1998 is giving me a larger colorful range. And so for that, you think, okay, more color upstream, you want to try to represent that at the back end, more color at the back end. You'd like to try to reproduce as much as possible. And Adobe 1998 is a standard when you're working with um, the G7 settings. You know, when you want to accomplish G7 and you're going for that type of target, um, people are going to say we're going to use that information um, to get more of a color space. Uh, okay, another good question. Um, to take your RGB image in an Illustrator AI CMYK document, and have Onyx do the conversion as opposed to it. So you can do that as well. You know, you can convert your information upstream, or you can let Onyx do those changes. And really it comes down to, uh, back in our settings here, um, what are you going to be using for your options? You know, what's, what are your settings going to be? For vectors, some people like to change this, if that's the case, maybe to a saturation choice with black point compensation 
and you have your vector information there. Again, you could do testing of this to see what you like. And then your images could even be relative color metric with black point compensation. Or you can have it all as relative color metric with black point compensation. A lot of these things, there's not really one way, one answer to say. It's a matter of your testing, testing this through and seeing what works best for you. Uh, but when it comes to those color conversions, I know of some shops that, um, a handful of shops that will purposely turn all ICC profiles off and a handful of shops that will open up their files here in, in, um, in my uh, Photoshop and they'll go right into their mode and they'll convert. They'll just say, I'm going to take RGB and squash it to CMYK. So the nice thing is this comes up and gives me the message to say, hey, you're about to take a file that's sRGB and you're going to default to your preset, US Web Coded Swap version 2. This may not be what you intend. And then they give you a suggestion to go to convert the profile where you have more options. So again, you can let the RIP software do the conversions. And again, I would say do some testing. Have it convert in one way through Illustrator. Have it convert the other way at the RIP same file. Um, test print this information out and compare and see what you're getting for your conversions. Because a lot of times you might have um, some smoother transitions possibly or some better color representation as well. So doing this, I know some shops that just take all RGBs and convert them to CMYK and they say, well, I'm getting, I know what I'm getting in my CMYK output, I know what I can match, and I'm kind of squashing out color in that sense. How, kind of how I look at it, like you're squashing out colors. So, so yeah, really just a matter of your preference. Do some testing and really kind of see where you're at with things because there could be that could be just enough of a difference that makes you change your mind on how you're working with your data. All right. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my desktop and you guys can have control of your computers again. And if there's no other questions, we'll wrap it up. Like I said, tomorrow at 11 o'clock, so most of these sessions have been 10 o'clock, but tomorrow at 11 o'clock, we're going to have the Achieving Brand Colors using our swatch books and adding that library um, to our print mode defined colors. We'll talk about that for tomorrow. Uh, very good comments. So some people are saying that they would convert or squash the CMYK. And like you said, a specific printer could make all the difference. Yeah, very good, very good. That's why you really have to print with the condition on the way out and see what you're getting. Yes, um, I'm going to, someone's asking is there a way to, to access the PDF you're working with anywhere. I'm promising you all my content. I'm definitely going to get those emailed out. Um, it's been one heck of a uh, time with all of the attendees uh, participating, so I'm trying to grab all the emails and, and get them consolidated, and then I'm going to send out some emails to everyone and give you all the documentation. Absolutely no problem. Yep, you're gonna, you'll be able to have all the information, no problem. All right, great. Thank you. So tomorrow's class is going to be at 11 o'clock Central Time, and it's titled Achieving Brand Colors with Swatch Books. So we're going to go through Swatch Books procedures 
as well as finding the color match and swatches and adding that to our color library. So that's good for logo color replacement. Um, that example, I had a logo red, but you might even have a Pantone color. So corporate colors, Pantone colors, basically it's vector spot colors. And we're going to be taking those vector spot colors, ripping them, printing them, evaluating them to the target, and saying, do I match or not? And if I don't match, how don't I match? In terms of lightness, chroma, hue, saturation, we're going to use swatch books, make a variety of alterations, find the recipe match, and add that to our library. So we're going to go through the whole complete swatch book scenario and, and add the recipe to our library. And for that, since we're really not in person, you know, I'm going to have uh, pictures coming up on the screen to kind of show you uh, some of these differences and definitely documentation for that, too. Yes, only one class tomorrow. It's the only one class, 11 o'clock till noon central time tomorrow. And then, like I said, we resume next, after tomorrow, we're going to resume next week, Monday, 11 a.m. to noon, and we're going to see uh, printing with the specialty inks. Uh, registration on the 26th, I see, swatch with 25th, oh boy. Well, if they got the swatch books down and the registration wrong, I will have uh, Corey take a look at that. I'll let him know, but thank you for letting me know that. And I'll let him get, get on board with that, get that fixed. And we'll have time, you know, by the time uh, you can get that up and going. So thank you so much. I'm going to let him know that right now with a quick uh, quick text message. Oh, and very good. I did not send the link to the training videos yet. It took a long time to process those down, and I want to go through them and make sure everything came through properly, and then I'll, I'll send you those links. So I promise you those links for sure. You'll get, you'll get the video information. All right, everybody, I'm going to go ahead and end the session. Thank you all for your participation, and we'll see you online tomorrow.